Hey, Paul, someone must have logged in uh, with the Marty Bloss details, is my guess, and started a new thing. If GBO web host is Paul. I, I am Paul. I am GBO web host. <clears throat> I do not. OK, we have participants. Excellent. Hi, all uh, apologies for the delay and the uh, the uh, slight uh, booting out of a few people here. I'm, this is uh, Karen O'Neill. I am the director here at Green Bank Observatory. And uh, we're going to start in just a moment as we give people a chance to get in there. And uh, Paul also got us uh, unable to uh, start our videos. If you could change that too, that'd be great. So again, we're running a little bit late, uh, technical difficulties, but we will be in uh, begin this in just a moment. Paul, are we, are we recording? We will be in a moment. OK. OK, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. I apologize again for everybody for the technical delays. I know a few people are still joining us after that. Um, but uh, um, even after a year of Zoom calls, sometimes things still happen. Anyway, I'm Karen O'Neill. I'm the director here at Green Bank Observatory. And I want to welcome all of you for taking some time out of your day to talk to uh, listen to a little bit of Green Bank science. So. Uh, today, I'm going to, as always, start off with just a bit of news about Green Bank Observatory and tell you some of the things going on. And then we'll move on to our highlight, which will be Brett McGuire talking about an update from the Gotham Large Project, which is a great project about uh, chemistry and astrochemistry uh, discoveries with a number of telescopes, including the GBT. So first, a highlight about what's going on in Green Bank. Of course, COVID is still what's on everybody's mind, even more than a year after this uh, the, the pandemic has started. Uh, good news is, of course, the uh, number of cases of COVID within the county, within the state of West Virginia, are going down and restrictions are beginning to lift. Uh, far more exciting news for us is the uh, rate of vaccines within the state, within the county. Uh, at this point, 14% of the West Virginia population is fully vaccinated and 22% uh, has received at least one dose. And the numbers within Pocahontas County, where Greenback Observatory is located, are even higher. So that's fantastic news for all of us. The GBT itself, of course, remains in full option 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as we have throughout this entire process. Uh, telescope and instruments are all in place. And right now we're starting to focus on our summer maintenance plan. Summer maintenance begins this year in May for us. And that's when we do a lot of the work on the telescope. Painting the telescope this year is one of our inspections, full structural inspections of the telescope, track maintenance, all of that type of activities going on. Um, other exciting news going on is we broke ground last week for the new Data Archive Center. So this is a, a new building that, that we're building funded by the National Science Foundation's Windows on the Universe program that's going to be able to host all of the uh, data taken with the GBT's Open Skies, NSF-funded Open Skies program. So that's exciting for us to see the, the ground literally broken, as you can see right there, um, as the uh, winter weather moves away and we're able to get that under construction. The goal is to have that center built within this calendar year and then start to populate it with disks uh, by the end of the calendar year. So that's very exciting. We've also had a lot of progress on our new ultra wideband receiver system. This is a four to eight gigahertz receiver that's focused primarily on pulsar science, although it's gonna be an exciting receiver for lots of different types of science on the GBT. You can see a couple of pictures here uh, showing some parts of the uh, ultra wideband feed, as well as the uh, um, quartz crystal that's going to go into the feeds itself. So that's, that's exciting news for us. Other things going on, this is the 20-year uh, anniversary of the first science taken with the GBT, and we have a workshop in April to celebrate that. This will be a virtual workshop. Information about that is online, and I encourage you, if you're interested, to sign up. We also have an in image contest that just completed, looking at images from the past 20 years that include GBT data. Those images are in. The judging is underway, and I can't wait to uh, be able to, public to let everybody know the results of that. And again, information on that is also online at the GBT 2021 celebration page. Finally, I just want to mention, of course, we're going to continue these community Zooms. These are bi-weekly. The next one will be on the uh, spin state of Venus with some great bi-static radar observations by Jean-Luc Margot. And then in April, we'll be talking about the uh, Mongoose galaxies. That's another large H1 survey 
uh, with Amy Sardone talking about that from Oregon State University. We also have our next observer training workshop sign up out there. This is a slightly different pattern for an observer training workshop because it's all going to be virtual. Um, we're going to actually try having this on an every other day pattern. So it's on May 24th, 26th, and 28th, giving people time in between to take their classes, do their other research, things like that. Sign up is online now. Again, you can get there just through the main Green Bank Observatory webpage. Go down to science and you can find the event or you can go to this link that you see. And then finally, the dates for the single dish school, uh, slightly tentative, are still up there. Again, this will be the single dish school followed by another observer training workshop. Those are set for mid-September. The sign up for that is anticipated to open in early July. So those are some of the exciting things going on around the observatory. I encourage you to go to our website if you want more details about any of that or contact any of the uh, scientific staff at the observatory to ask questions about it. So with that, I just want to uh, thank everybody again oops, for being here. And I will hand this off now to Brett McGuire to talk about some of the great astrochemistry results he's been getting. So Brett, I'll hand this off to you now. All right, thanks, Karen. Go ahead and get a screen share working here. All right, uh, so today I'm really happy to give everybody a, an overview and a whirlwind update on the Gotham Large project that my collaborators and I have been conducting on the GBT for the last uh, several years. Um, and of course, Gotham is an acronym as is mandatory for all astronomy projects as phase one of conceiving them. And in our case, it stands for GBT observations of TMC1 hunting aromatic molecules. Uh, so here's our, our legally dissimilar logo that we're very proud of, made for us by former NRAO data analyst, Melissa Hoffman, who's now at STSCI. So give her a shout out uh, if you see her in the future for her awesome work here. So as I said, Gotham started out as a large project on the GBT to study the chemistry occurring in uh, TMC1, uh, a cold, dark, starless molecular cloud. Um, but it has since evolved into a true international collaboration with a, a much broader focus on understanding uh, not only the complex carbon chemistry that's occurring in TMC1, uh, but to help us understand where that chemistry came from and where it's going to go next as the process of star and planet formation evolves. And of course, we have to look at sources other than TMC1 uh, to get those sorts of snapshots in uh, cosmic time. Excuse so me, Brad, our, yep. Brad, you have the no build effects um image on top of your slide. I have absolutely no idea what that means. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Let me see if I can, hold on, I will stop screen sharing and see if I can get it to go away. Let's see here. We'll exit keynote and open keynote again. All right, is there still some sort of note on top of the slides? Yeah, yes. still there. Ah, oh, well, I think you can proceed without it. Uh, proceed. All right, give me give me half yeah, a second yeah. here. I'll try something different. It's just going to screw up one of the uh, one of the animations. We will switch <coughs> to the PDFs. Should be gone now. It is. All right, so we'll click through here and hopefully, there we go. Uh, so anyways, our, our collaboration here uh, touches on all three areas of astrochemistry. So we have folks, of course, working on the observational astrophysics portion of things. Uh, we also have a dedicated laboratory team uh, conducting uh, uh, laboratory experiments, both spectroscopic and also measuring reaction rates. Uh, and we have a, a team of astrochemical modelers trying to interpret the results of these observations. And I'm going to touch largely on the observational side of things, because this is a GBO thing, uh, just a, a few words about the laboratory work. And unfortunately, I won't touch much on the models this time. So 
before I go any further, I want to make sure to get the whole collaboration up here in front of everybody and give major shout outs to my co-PIs. Um, they are Andrew Burkhart, who is an SMA fellow at the CFA, uh, who leads our observational sub team. Uh, Elsa Cook, who is a Marie Curie fellow at Rennes, uh, who leads our laboratory sub team. Uh, and Siju, who is a, a senior graduate student here at the University of Virginia, leads our modeling sub team. And you can see all the wonderful people here that contribute. Um, and of course, this is astrochemistry. So everybody sorts of uh, blurs the lines at times between these different sub teams. Um, so if you see them, give them a shout out as well for the fantastic work that you're going to see today. So I want to give a little uh, bit of brief background on how we got started in Gotham. Uh, way back in the year uh, 2016, that was in the before times, uh, one of our Gotham members, Sergey, uh, was looking through old data from TMC-1 taken by Norio Kaifu on the Nobeyama 45 meter telescope. Uh, and he found that if he stacked together, so averaged up all the possible transitions of this molecule shown here, benzonitrile in that data, and then averaged them all up, it was this hint of signal in the old data from the Nobeyama uh, 45 meter. Now, none of these transitions was seen above the noise level of the observations, um, but in aggregate, the signal was quite suggestive. Now, this would have been a major find, uh, by far the largest and most complex molecule ever seen outside of buckyballs in space, and uh, certainly the largest seen with radio astronomy. And further, it would provide us with the detection of an aromatic molecule, a structural motif that's ubiquitous in chemistry here on Earth and in life. So we put in a proposal uh, to follow up with the GBT and try to confirm that this molecule was present. And uh, well, we didn't let a silly little thing like an SRP report here stop us. Uh, we got our filler time uh, observations, uh, as well as some uh, uh, fantastic DDT results. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and we finally managed to confirm the presence of this molecule in the source uh, by using the power of the GBT, its raw sensitivity, to integrate down on the individual spectral lines of this molecule, uh, which we published in 2018. <clears throat> now, one of the reasons that we were so excited was because this molecule was not where it was supposed to be. Uh, this source, TMC1, is not the place where we would expect to see large aromatic molecules like this. And that's because since the 1980s, uh, we've been struggling as a community to understand the unidentified infrared bands, the, the series of strong emission lines seen in countless sight lines in our galaxy and others, and shown here on the left of the screen, that have the characteristic features of being due to the bending and stretching modes of large aromatic molecules, uh, particularly polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the molecules that I've shown example of here on the left. Now, we can tell from the intensities of these lines and from the, the aggregate emission spectra that we see here, these characteristic features that depending on who we ask, something like 10 to 25% of all interstellar carbon is locked up in molecules like these. But these signals in the infrared are not distinct enough to let us identify any individual PAH. But we also knew, or thought we knew, that these molecules were primarily produced in hot, dense environments, like the envelopes around evolved stars, post-AGB stars, or in preplanetary nebulae. The fact then that we found benzonitrile, right, sort of the, the one of the simplest members of this uh, family of aromatic molecules uh, in a cold, dark, starless cloud like TMC1, as far away from uh, an AGB star as you could possibly get. Well, that was super exciting. Uh, either it survived the vastness of the diffuse ISM and its harsh radiation fields without being destroyed to, to seed the, the cloud TMC1, or it was built up in situ using some sort of mechanism that we weren't expecting. So naturally, we had some questions. Uh, we want to know whether this benzonitrile and any other aromatic molecule is uh, built up in this source TMC1, or if it was inherited. And we want to ask the question, are there other aromatic molecules in this source? Right? What's going on? What's contributing to this chemistry that we're seeing? Uh, and we want to know whether or not this chemistry is unique to TMC1. Right? Is this source a unicorn, or is this more indicative of some uh, general unexplored uh, chemistry uh, throughout the star and planet formation process that we need to explore in more detail? So now onto the actual observations that we've undertaken with Gotham to try to answer these questions. Uh, the main data product coming out of the GBT is a high resolution, high sensitivity spectral line survey of TMC1. Um, down here in the middle between 18 and 22 gigahertz, these little chunks of spectra here that are much noisier than the rest 
Uh, these are the chunks of data we used to identify benzonitrile originally back in 2018. Uh, and you can see that we have substantially expanded our coverage through the course of uh, several hundred hours of observations as part of this large program, uh, going uh, down as low now actually as C and S band, uh, and we're pushing up as high as we can get in the Ka band without having to actually do uh, uh, dish forming observations, which are uh, inefficient for the, the kind of survey work that we want to do. So this is the, the survey as it was uh, as of uh, the, the middle of last year, uh, and we started to publish some early results from it. So I want to give you a, a look at what our data look like, how they compare to that initial set of observations with benzonitrile here, uh, and some of the first results that we have coming out in terms of new molecule detections. So next slide here, if I go in the right direction, uh, this is our original benzonitrile detection that I talked about earlier. You can see here we have uh, a handful of lines, uh, some at relatively good signal to noise, some that only I could love and appreciate, but they're there anyways. Um, and now uh, here's an example of our benzonitrile lines taken with the, the large program. Um, you can see that they're at much higher signal to noise and our resolution is fantastic. We can uh, resolve not only the individual hyperfine splitting, but the individual velocity components within the TMC1 cloud. Uh, even though it is relatively quiescent, there, are still, there is still substructure underneath there that we can uh, now observe and model. Now, uh, one of the things that I want to stop and talk about on this slide and that will be uh, important going forward uh, is how confident we are in the detection of this molecule in this source, right? So we have, uh, as a community, uh, arrived at a set of standards for detecting a new molecule that are relatively qualitative, um, and they're, they're laid out in detail, particularly from the work of Lou Snyder. Um, they deal with detecting an appropriate number of transitions to make sure you have the spectral pattern down, making sure everything is uh, um, lined up in velocity space and that the intensities make sense and so forth. So we can look at the detection on the left here and say, well, we have a large number of lines in the spectral pattern and they're at decent signal to noise. But the detection on the right here, if we just assume that these are the only four lines that we have, well, these are at much, much higher signal to noise, much higher resolution, but there's far fewer of them. We have fewer pieces of this pattern. So it's harder to tell which one of these is the better detection. So we wanted to find a way to not only enhance our ability to see weak molecules, but to put a statistical significance on the detection, to be able to say that this is a five sigma or a 10 sigma uh, set of evidence for the presence of this molecule. So what we've done is expanded upon that technique of stacking molecules that Sergey started with here and borrowed some techniques from the, the exoplanet atmosphere and, and radar communities uh, to, to put an actual number on this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of our individual lines of uh, benzonitrile and we're going to chunk out the spectra on either side and center the line at zero kilometers per second. Uh, and then what we're going to do, and this is, this is work here that's been led by Ryan Loomis and Kelvin Lee, uh, is we're going to do a signal to noise weighted average of all of those lines on top of one another. So we lose the pattern, but because we know precisely where the lines are from the laboratory, that's okay. Uh, we average them all up so that they're at this zero channel. And if you add up about, uh, and I'm not sure the animation will play here, if you add up all of the lines yeah, for our, for our benzonitrile, you see that we get a much, much greater signal to noise here than in any one individual transition. So we go from about 13 sigma to about 28 sigma here, and that's in this central peak channel. So now this is one signal for the molecule. We don't have the pattern underlying it anymore, but we're not done yet. There's more significance to extract because each one of these channels also has its own significance. This is real emission from multiple velocity components and from the width of the line. And we've done a lot of work to properly model this here using our fitting to get the right column density, excitation temperature, and so forth. So we're secondly going to use a technique here uh, that Ryan put together for protoplanetary disk observations and adapted for GBT observations, where we take our model here in red that we fit to the data and we push it through, and the animation won't play, sorry, uh, as a, a matched filter to see how well our, uh, our supposition that this molecule is present with these parameters is reproduced in the data. And this goes through pushes to the other side, and we record the response of that function. It's a, it's a numpy.correlate function here. And that actually gives us a significance on the detection. So in this case for benzonitrile, we're up to 53 sigma uh, for our, our Gotham data. 
which is really handy because now we can say that we have X amount of evidence for the presence of a molecule in the source. So let's talk about some actual molecules. Um, how do we want to choose what we're going to look for? Well, our laboratory team here, and this is work led by Mike McCarthy and Kelvin Lee, uh, said, let's just let the chemistry do the, do the talking. So they started with benzene and nitrogen, the components of benzonitrile that we started with. They hit them with a bolt of electricity in the laboratory, blew them to bits, and let them recombine into whatever products they would like. And then we'll filter through those products and see if any of our are of interest for our survey. So using some techniques developed uh, in Mike's lab over the last uh, five years or so and some wonderful Python tools you can all go and download written by, by Kelvin here, uh, they were able to identify more than 100 different products, uh, chief of which uh, that we were interested in were these two ringed species, 1 and 2 cyanocyclopenadiene, five-membered rings with a cyanide group on the end big bright dipole moment, strong transitions in the range of our survey data. So we immediately went and uh, took a look for them. And back in May of 2019, uh, we had uh, a decent detection of the one cyanocyclopenadiene here and, and just a hint of the two cyanocyclopenadiene. So we went ahead and, and published that. Uh, it came out earlier this fall, but of course we kept taking observations after we did this initial detection. And as uh, the GBT churned out higher and higher sensitivity data, our detection uh, of both of these molecules increased substantially, even now to the point for the one cyanocyclopenadiene uh, where we can see the individual lines popping out now from underneath the noise. Uh, and these are the first five membered ring molecules ever detected in space, which is quite exciting for us. Um, even more exciting, uh, and uh, this is uh, news that will come out uh, tomorrow, actually. Uh, benzonitrile here is a good proxy for benzene, which we can't see with radio astronomy, no dipole moment. So why not look for cyanonaphthalene here, one and two proxies for this neutral PAH that we can't see with radio astronomy. Uh, and as I said, these uh, results are embargoed until tomorrow, so please don't share. Um, but in our Gotham data, uh, we do have strong detections of both of these PAHs, 1 and 2 cyanonaphthalene. Uh, and in fact, the 1 cyanonaphthalene, the data are now so good off of the GBT that we have individual lines here uh, showing that rotational spectral pattern without even the need to do this stacking. And these are the first PAHs ever identified in space, which is exciting because now we can study that chemistry in detail. These, of course, aren't the only molecules that we have coming out of Gotham. We have a slew of others that have been published or are in preparation, uh, and there are even more that aren't on this slide. Uh, so please keep an eye on your news feeds for, for more new molecule detections coming out of Gotham and all of the associated modeling work uh, and laboratory work attempting to understand the chemistry and the implications of these in this source. Uh, finally, last slide here of new science, I want to highlight a sub-project with its own uh, uh, acronym, ARCAM, a rigorous K-band hunt for aromatic molecules, also on the GBT, uh, led by Andrew Burkhart here. Uh, and this is an attempt to see if this chemistry is, is operative and present outside of TMC1. Uh, and so <clears throat> we've taken a look at a number of different dark cloud sources uh, in the Serpens cluster, uh, as well as in one protostar, and we do indeed detect benzonitrile in all of these sources, uh, showing that it's likely that this new chemistry we're uncovering in TMC1 is in fact widespread. So we have a number of projects on the GBT both this semester and proposed to continue uh, to look at even more sources and try to understand how uh, this new chemistry varies with evolutionary stage and, and chemical conditions. So those three questions that I asked at the beginning, we're still not sure whether or not this, uh, these molecules are built up in the source or not. We need more uh, laboratory work, more modeling, and more observations to answer that question. Uh, but there are certainly other aromatic molecules present in TMC1, and, and this chemistry is not confined to TMC1. Uh, so it's an exciting time to be using the GBT to look at these very, very large molecules for the first time in space that we just haven't had access to before. Uh, so I'll, I'll just leave up here and say that we're, we're continuing work in all of these areas. And as I said, I, I didn't have time to touch on the modeling work, um, but please do check out the, the publications for, for um, an overview of that. Um, and if you want to get uh, in contact with me, here's my, my contact information. Happy to answer follow-up questions. And just a big thank you to all of my collaborators and sources of funding. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Brett. Um, if there are questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll wait a moment to see if people are uh, 
answering or, or asking anything. Let me just ask about the time scale for Gotham and Arkham. Um, mm -hmm. it, are, are the observations continuing now? Yeah, so uh, Gotham continues through the end of the semester, and then we should be done with our, our first allotment of time. Um, we've put in a proposal this time around to, to continue to expand that survey. Um, so if you are on uh, the SRPs, uh, please view us favorably. Um, Arkham also just concluded its its uh, latest round of observations. So we're, we're, uh, we're feverishly working a way to reduce that data and see what it tells us. Uh, and we have uh, more observations planned uh, on the VLA and uh, also proposals into uh, some uh, complementary telescopes at higher frequencies to really hammer in on the on the chemistry happening in this source. Okay, we've got some questions here. Um, the work that you quoted Kelvin did, is that line ID or something else? Uh, sure. So the the um, uh, the work in the laboratory, I, I suppose, is, is what's being talked about here. Uh, this is for not only identifying and fitting the spectra of these molecules, so identifying the individual lines and assigning quantum uh, numbers to them, but identifying the molecules themselves, because a lot of the species that we make in these uh, reaction screening experiments, where we just blow a couple things up, uh, have either never been observed before uh, their, their, uh, in terms of their spectra, so we don't know what the lines are we should be looking for, but some of them have never been observed before by humanity. Uh, they're molecules we haven't dreamed up. Uh, and so Kelvin developed a, a really fantastic set of software to go with some of Mike's uh, protocols that he has developed in the laboratory that helps us pick apart what the, the signals we're seeing correspond to in, in terms of the structure of molecules and, and what the, the underlying uh, molecule itself might be that's giving rise to those spectra. Okay, we have a number of questions now. Have you tried observing Sagittarius B2? Oh, I have observed a lot of time at Sagittarius B2. And in fact, one of our collaborators uh, in, in Gotham, uh, Anthony Remigen, Tony Remigen, uh, had a, a previous large project on the GBT called Primos and the Prebiotic Interstellar Molecular Survey, uh, which was a, a similar, actually broader bandwidth survey with the GBT of, of Sag B2N. Um, it's an incredibly line rich and, and dense source. Um, we don't see many of the same molecules in that source that we see in TMC1. There's a little bit of overlap, um, but so far, no hint of any of these large aromatic molecules there. It's not to say that they're not present, um, but the chemistry has evolved quite a bit by that point in, in time for, for stellar evolution. Uh, and the source is also quite a bit warmer. Uh, so it's not as optimal observing conditions for these large molecules, um, but never say never, uh, we might eventually find them there. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, and another question. Have you searched for aromatic molecules carrying a longer side group as shown on your initial slide? We have indeed. Um, so, so far we've come up empty, uh, even for ones that are longer side groups, including nitrogen. Um, we've taken a look at ones that, that also have oxygens or sulfur or that have hydrocarbon chains attached to them. Um, uh, no luck so far. That's not necessarily because uh, molecules with that motif aren't present. It might just be that we haven't uh, found the right ones to look for. Maybe the chemistry isn't favorable. Um, maybe those in particular are formed on dust grains and, and aren't released into the gas phase yet. Um, we also have to make sure that we have uh, appropriately accurate uh, spectra. We need very, very, very high accuracy, very precise line frequencies in order for this uh, stacking detection method to work. If you're off by the, even a fraction of a line width, uh, all of the signal disappears, it gets smeared out. Um, so a lot of these molecules we might be interested in looking for haven't been studied in the laboratory yet. Uh, so we're working on that aspect of it as well. <laughs> um, we've got a suggestion that we have a project on chemistry in our single dish school, and I can say that the GBO staff will be considering that very seriously. And then one final question. Um, is there a possibility to increase survey range using ALMA, for example? And it says, for sure, lab measurements in this range would be necessary. And then a postscript and EMOCA, E-M-O-C-A. Sure. Um, so, so EMOCA, what they're talking about there is the is exactly uh, what they've suggested, but for, for Sagittarius B2N. So it extends the kind of work that Tony has done with Primos, the GBT, up into the millimeter uh, and submillimeter uh, regime using, using ALMA. 
Um, now that actually works out incredibly well for Sagittarius B2N because uh, that source is relatively compact in the sky. So it benefits quite a bit uh, from the, the resolving power, actually the, 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 the smaller beam size of Alma uh, to match the source size that we're looking at. Um, we have uh, strongly considered using an interferometer uh, to try to map out uh, TMC1. And in fact, we're, we're attempting to do that at low frequencies. Um, ALMA at the higher frequencies might actually resolve out the structure of this source because the source is quite extended. So it could be relatively difficult to look at. Uh, that said, we, we do have um, uh, proposals in to the LMT. Uh, to observe TMC1 in the millimeter and submillimeter to extend up that high. Um, there are existing observations in the, in the literature um, from the IRM 30 meter. Uh, it's mostly done by Pepe Chernachara's group uh, up in the millimeter wave regime as well. Uh, and also, if you, if you look at the literature uh, in, in the last, say, six months or so, uh, Pepe's group has also been surveying TMC1 with a new telescope, the EBS 40 meter uh, at Q band um, and, and a little higher than that. Um, complementary to the range that we're using right now and has also been having fantastic uh, luck detecting new molecules in this source. Um, so it's, it's a really hot source to be surveying and a really great time to be looking at TMC1. Okay, we have time for one last question. And let me remind everybody that this talk, as well as almost all the other talks in this series, are available on the G Green Bank Observatory website. So you can go back and replay it at your leisure. Our final question, uh, are the side groups infrared active and so potentially part of the PA spectrum? Are they robust in the more diffuse interstellar medium? So those are two different questions. Um, we think, and, and there's observations and, and calculations to support this, the smaller PAHs are likely not very robust in the diffuse interstellar medium. They're likely to be destroyed uh, preferentially by, by background UV radiation. This uh, leads us to suspect that these smaller ones are probably formed in situ in TMC1, but we don't have the observational evidence for that yet. Um, uh, as to the contribution to the, to the, the UIRs, um, certainly uh, these would contribute uh, to, to those spectra. Um, the question is whether they would contribute strongly or not, um, meaning uh, it's not clear to us, uh, I'm not sure that it's, it's clear to anybody, just how many different individual PAH uh, species are contributing to the UIRs. Uh, and so the relative dominance or contribution of any one molecule, like the cyanonaphthalenes, to those spectra uh, could be quite large or it could be relatively minimal, depending on the individual transition and the chemistry of the source that we're looking at. One of the things that we really want to do once we have our models in shape for these small PAHs uh, is predict what the contribution might be to the UIRs from a, a distribution of PAH is like we're observing in TMC1 and, and see whether or not that would be a major minor contributor uh, to, the, to the UIR emission in various different regions. It's a, it's a really great idea. Okay, um, thanks very much. Uh, and let me just mention again, if you go to the Green Bank Observatory website and you look under science, you will see one of the first tabs there is the link to uh, these community webinars. Uh, please join us two weeks from now where we'll be discussing the spin state of Venus. Thanks again and goodbye.